another week, another episode of the Football Tailgaters podcast, where we go over hot topics in the NFL. Let me introduce ourselves, starting with our Jets fan, Yams, the unbiased fan in the group, Andy, and myself, Aaron. I'm a Cowboys fan in the group, and we got week 12 pretty much in the books, uh, except for obviously Monday night, we're recording this right before the Bears and Vikings game, but we're going to start with the recap of week 12. And at the very end, you know, go over the usual about fantasy stuff and week 13 picks. So, as always, let's start with our weekly biggest disappointment for week 12. What is that for you guys? Uh, well, once again, it's the Jets. Uh, need I say it more? It's this team is in free fall. A Hail Mary taking for a return 99 yards for a touchdown. It can't get worse than this, right? For me, it's the Lions. You lost to Green Bay on primetime Thanksgiving. It was the moment to shut up non-believers that you are a legitimate Super Bowl contender and you weren't competitive almost the entire game. I'll go with the Lions as well. And it's very troubling to see a team with such a good record, although it is a divisional game. And, you know, they are kind of cursed when it comes to Thanksgiving. It's not very good. And they haven't been good in the past years. You know, they've been kind of up and down, right? You had the whole like stint with Stafford and, and Johnson. And as soon as they finally get some kind of rhythm go- going, now they seem to drop another dud on a very important game, divisional game against the Packers. That's very disappointing for me. What about weekly biggest surprise for week 12? So every time I see the Texans up there, I get really jealous. They're really impressive they have a rookie head coach they have a rookie offensive coordinator that he brought from 49ers a rookie quarterback rookie wide receivers and it's just it's all working you can see that this team is progressing to be a team for the future for the texans by the way <laughs> <laughs> how about the denver broncos going five and zero in the last five games they have beaten the chiefs and the bills sean Payne might have been right about the, his criticism of hackett and sean is now making russ cook once again <laughs> um and he took my list i'm also going with the denver broncos who are on a hot streak right now going five in a row and against good teams you can't you can't write it off as being mediocre teams they're going up against competitive teams that are playoff contenders like the chiefs bills and even browns so that complete turnaround from the f- like first three weeks where they had losses right And then they won a pretty serious close game against the Bears. And then it's been kind of like shaky around there, but it seems like they're getting their act together. Good for them. And now they're making the AFC West a lot more competitive now. And that's exciting to watch. Let's get into the main talk now. And the biggest news that broke, obviously, right? And to some, it might have been a surprise. And we're going to get our thoughts on that. Frank Wright was fired from the Panthers. That's a huge deal, right? Head coach. Mid-season, the Panthers sit, you know, dead last in the whole league. They're probably the worst team in the league, right? Was Frank Wright the problem for the Panthers? I think it's a premature firing. Too soon, too early. I think the problem is with David Tepper. He is impatient and he butts in too much. He doesn't let head coaches or GMs do their, their job. And But, you know, let's say they don't meet eye to eye. I am fond of firing quickly and just starting all over. And maybe this is how he feels, but I still think it's the wrong move. I would say it's 50% the owner's fault, 25% the GM, and 25% the coach. That's a lot of math. Well, that's 100%. The head coach wanted CJ Stroud and the GM as well, I believe. But the owner wanted Young. So it seems like the Carolina Panthers have a Jerry Jones dilemma that the owner is meddling in. And let, my, and let me say that he does have the tendency to fire quickly as that is what he is known for in his soccer ownership. I will say it, it is a pretty big problem specifically for the, for the owner. And it's a good example of I'm not saying it's bad that you can get hands on with your team. Right. But if you're going to do it, you, you got to do it right. You got to know what you're doing. and. He probably, you know, he thinks he knows what he's doing. I mean, he fired the coach, right? Thinking that this is a good move. And I would say it's not 100%, you know, the correct move yet, right? You got, he's been pretty impatient. They've been doing the head coaching roulette for a while, right? Um, Especially when they had that special stint with 
uh ron rivera uh that i mean try, trying to recap all that is kind of i don't want to get into that but it's it's not good what they're what's going on there and especially when they draft the right bryce young who is considered one of the quarterbacks that needs development and isn't a starter right away to say like, you know, he's, he's going to be a great starter, right? There was speculation, right? That he wasn't going to be that good. Obviously height problems, whatever. Right. But Frank Reich liked them and that was the whole thing. So they had, they, they obviously drafted him for a reason. And now that the head coach that drafted your franchise quarterback is gone, you have to scramble together and try and find someone that can take over. That's capable of fixing this team and as well, getting the GM to get some weapons for Bryce Young, right? You don't have any weapons over there. You got Adam Thielen, who's probably your best guy on the team. You got Miles Sanders. You paid that guy, and he's not doing good, right? You're, you're splitting the snaps with Chuba Hubbard. That's a problem. And your number one receiver is someone who's kind of... I wouldn't say he's declining because he's still doing great. He's, he's a great wide receiver, but he's getting up there. So Panthers have problems. That's that's a bad thing, and I don't think this fire was all that great, if I'm honest. But you no, know, whatever it is over there, I guess hopefully they figure out. But it's it's not looking good for them. He was one of the coaches that everybody was putting in the hot seat. Unfortunately, he didn't. It was his first year. He couldn't really establish himself. I'm just torn between two sides as he has been fired from the Colts. He couldn't do anything there. He came to the Panthers and was just not doing anything. Is this a situation in which he's just not good as a head coach? Or we have too many people meddling in into his business and not letting him just take over as as a head coach and run this team? It, it, I don't know because Matt Rule was in... Carolina Panthers for what four years three years before he was fired and then before that who was it oh Ron Riviera right was he the owner there at the time well I believe Tapper uh, joined the ownership in 2018 um, I can check really so quickly Ron Riviera was part of that team well or under him and he was patient with Ron Riviera he gave Matt Rule some time too before letting him go so well no he wasn't patient with Matt Rivera if Matt Rivera had Cam Ma- Newton. No, the, no, but the Ron Rivera thing is complicated. And Ron Rivera has been there for a lot of years, but I remember Tapper yeah. came in, in in 2018. It's been five years. So if you're saying that Matt Rule was there for three years, well, this is the fourth year. So he really wasn't there for Ron Rivera's tenure there. Right. I guess right. I'll... So as a, I, I believe Carol, um, he was a, head, uh, I believe Matt Rule was the head coach in 2020 to 2021 2021 to 2022 and i guess 2021 i guess in the third year he was fired midway so two and a half years is that enough for a head coach to I, I, to show I think, his accomplishments and to be able to build a team no i i think something happened that they're not seeing eye to eye maybe they got into an argument or something right because he did not want to draft bryce, bryce young right he, everyone or the word out there supposedly was cj strout and maybe just how that Texans team is just performing, just pushed him over the edge and just yeah. let him go. Yeah, he, uh, there was reports think... that that the owner came out of the locker room after the games, just throwing a lot of f bombs and not wanting to like even look at reporters. He was just extremely angry. But I'm fear that it's mostly an uh, as an emotional decision. Even though I don't think it was, it, it, I don't think the the season would be salvageable at this point. You could say it's a little bit of like, um, I don't know. It, it was definitely, um, he, he acted upon his emotions, right? He didn't, it's not a, a good thing to do that, right? Like you, you got to think it through. You got to sit down and, you know, maybe have your meetings and stuff like that and, and really plan it out. And it seems like, yeah, you got pushed over the edge and seeing probably that success with CJ Stroud and Texans. And just to confirm, uh, yeah, so he lasted one year under David 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 Tapper, Ron Rivera. Because yeah. right after that, in 2020, he became the head coach of the Commanders. Let me ask you guys this. Who is actually going to be wanting this head coaching Everybody. job? Everybody. It's a high-paying job. I, I mean, I, I, I'm that sure. That question so... That's, I don't know. We're saying about high-valued coaches that really want an opportunity. Yeah. For example, Joe the Judge? Off- no. For example, the the offensive coordinator for the Detroit Lions. He actually turned them down last year, and he decided to be the Detroit Lions offensive coordinator. Why would he be interested in taking this role? Like whoever takes this head coaching job, you know that Bryce Young is going to be your quarterback.
contract for the next like four years or so yep. or less depending how he continues to play but you have to continue with this quarterback and that and i've always said the very first thing that a head coach does uh, before checks before he takes on a team is to see who's going to be the quarterback and the GM they threw they they threw away a really good uh, receiver with DJ Moore and they've been dismantling this team so it's not like a really great like opportunity for a high value coach I know a lot of players I mean it seems like anybody would like to just be a head coach at the moment uh, I mean we saw last year with um, what's that center's name uh, Jeff Saturday to be the head coach a little bit for the Colts we're seeing this year Pierce is the head coach interim head coach for the Raiders I'm sure there's going to be a lot of ex-players to be wanting the coaching job but va- high value coaches I don't think that's a that's very interesting tough luck for Wright he got uh, fired apparently uh, a week before his birthday that's a tough outing for him at least he can celebrate it with his family and friends he also yeah. says no hard feelings but you know how it is let's move on to the next topic and stay in the NFC and go over one of the Thanksgiving games, right? And specifically the one in the morning, right? I think it's the one that kind of stood out for everyone, obviously. And that was the Detroit Lions and Green Bay Packers. Green Bay Packers upset the Detroit Lions in what seemed to be a favorable game for the Lions, but they unfortunately drop a dud with some question marks going around here. Are the Detroit Lions pretenders? I think so. Uh, they put up a stinker a couple of weeks ago against Baltimore. They were down like 28 to, I don't know, they were just down. And then they go ahead and put another stinker up here on Thanksgiving. And like you said earlier, Aaron, I guess they're known for not playing good on Thanksgiving, but I just don't see this team. They're just, I just don't, they're good. They're just not good enough. Whenever Jared Goff is being pressured, it's just not going to be pretty. We'll see next year. I really wish their defense was a little bit better. Maybe next year. Just this year, they have so many weapons. I mean, the wide receivers, they're amazing. The tight end, the running backs, even the quarterbacks, not horrible. It's just very disappointing that they are not at that level that, I mean, I wish them to be. They, um, they've, People have said that they are great but not good enough to be the NFC contender. And it just showed in Thanksgiving that they are not because they've only been one really good team, and that was all the way in week one against the Chiefs. Yeah, the past two weeks have been not so good for the Lions. And we've seen some problems, obviously, with Goff being pressured. He doesn't always perform to the best. But we can clearly say that the highlight of the Detroit Lions is their offense, right? I don't think necessarily has anything to do with the coaching, right? They got great, great offensive pieces. It's just really the defense. Uh, I've noticed that the defensive line isn't all that good, right? Even though they got Hutchinson, right? He's been pretty good, but they still have to work on the defense. And if the line doesn't pressure, the defensive line doesn't pressure, obviously. It doesn't create any sacks or, again, I said pressures, but that puts a lot of more pressure on the secondary. And the secondary isn't strong either. So you're going to see a lot of problems where these guys can like fall behind right and the offense isn't always you can kind of like say it's the opposite of whenever you have a great defense right for example i don't know like the cowboys or something like that whenever they fall behind it's hard to catch up and for the lions if the offense doesn't perform or if the defense doesn't perform well the offense may have trouble sometimes and that's what we're kind of seeing here especially with the divisional opponent like the green bay packers who seem to be Pretty dominant against them, right? Especially when Aaron Rodgers was there. But yeah, they got a lot of issues. It's not over, obviously. This is nothing to hit the panic button. Nothing. There's nothing wrong with this team. It's just it needs to get better. There's flaws and they're just not ready yet. Let's move on to the last main topic of this episode and go over to the AFC. AFC East, the New England Patriots. Oh boy. So that's a whole issue there, right? We've talked about them for a bit every now and then throughout the season, right? With Bill Belichick and if he's washed or if he should move on from the team, all that kind of stuff. And the quarterback situation with New England Patriots is obviously one of the main topics because, you know, defense is pretty good, although they have a lot of injuries going on there. Um, but it's it's the offense here. That's the problem. And specifically the quarterback situation that they have. Should Mac Jones asked to be released from the Patriots. 
Absolutely. I feel really bad for this kid, even though his gameplay hasn't been that great. Yeah, he's thrown interceptions here and there, but it seems like the kid has been asking for help to be developed. Last year, he looked for outside help. Bill Belichick hated that. And now he's being benched like every week. Like, Bill Belichick, what are you doing? Decide if he's going to start him or not. So I definitely would ask for my release after the season. So all the quarterbacks from this draft class are not good, right? We have. Just Trevor Lawrence. Just Trevor Lawrence. If Mac Jones believes he can play in this league, which yada yada, okay, sure. Go ahead and ask for release. I don't think he can play in this league. He keeps getting benched because he keeps throwing interceptions. Like Aaron Rodgers says, ball security is job security. And that's why he's losing his job to Bailey Zappi. Unfortunately, Bill Belichick knows both of them suck, so he keeps going back to Mac Jones. He's been benched four times. Mac Jones have been has been benched four times this season. Four times. And the whole quarterback situation and the way that Bill Belichick is dealing with um, is very interesting to me. And I think at this point, the way they're sitting right, they're dead last in what seems to be already right, like a clear set for them to get a top pick in the draft, this coming draft, right? And they got to look more towards that and maybe try to get rid of Mac Jones, right? But this is more... I guess since the question is more of so Mac Jones, should he leave? I think he should definitely leave. And it's it sucks for him because he's been trying to at least be good, right? But the situation there, it, it doesn't fit him. It does not fit him. And the way they've been kind of, I guess, treating him, I would see it a little bit disrespectful, but only because he's trying to improve, right? I don't think he's a terrible quarterback, but I don't think he's all that great. But the guy just wants to play and play good, and he doesn't have the best offense, right? And they don't give him weapons, so that's also a problem. So the guy's struggling out there. Do you think, because he doesn't have any weapons, that Bill Belichick is trying to score, I guess, in the next year's draft? Yeah, a better quarterback, Drake May. Why would he be benching him then? Because Bailey Zappi sucks even worse. No, but why would you start Mac well, Jones see, on the next week? And I mean, yeah, that doesn't I, make that, sense that to me. Also does, yeah, you're right. That doesn't make sense. Why Why do you keep... Yeah, I don't know, but they're two and... No, that, that actually... They're dismissed two and nine. Him. Yeah, no. They're two and eight. No. That were dismissed of him of him tanking it. Like, there's no point of doing that. If you have a sucky team and with a sucky quarterback, just continue starting that sucky quarterback. But it's yeah. a way of just showing that you're trying but not trying. But hey, I mean, the guy doesn't suck. At least try to get some assets from him if you're trying to get rid of him. I think that's what should be going on. He should be on the trading block. He he should the the Patriots should be like you know hey this is this guy you know you can have him and <laughs> for a certain price and yeah I mean it would suck if that would come out because that would completely demolish Mac Jones and but I mean at this point like what would you rather have right like would you rather be bench randomly four times throughout the season at least because the season is not over or would you rather be looked at as a trade asset. And they're like, this team is moving on from you. And what you can do as Mac Jones is, hey, let me just try my best as as hard as I can with all the power that I have, you know, because obviously he could get benched, right, uh, to be good. And, you know, that hasn't really been the case. So it's not really working out for either side. And they should definitely move on, like, as soon as possible. And I think this draft is a good turning point for the Patriots to get something better. Yeah, I would like to say that. And you, I mean, you brought in, you brought up the draft, and Bill Belichick, he is the GM, and he has a horrible tra- track record in the draft in the last like ten years. Like he does, maybe hit like on two players in the whole draft, two three players. But like honestly, every first rounder that he has drafted has not been playing well. He does do really well in free agency and trade for players that he sees that are good to develop Mm -hmm. from other teams. But from college, he's not that good. He has a really good relationship with Nick Saban. People have said that, hey, maybe the next Alabama quarterback is going to do well. But we just saw him like draft Mac Jones and it didn't work well. And that's an Alabama quarterback. I mean, I'm sorry. People have said that maybe he should leave patriots and go to the panthers and work with bryce young but i think that's just a big mistake as well we can assume that caleb williams is going to be off the list by the time the patriots draft are they i mean how is he dropping caleb williams i'm not sure no i don't no, think he's he, dropping no, but he's still uh, considered a top at what point right now and what position are the patriots they're in third. right now they're third 
So, I mean, if they get Drake May from, Assuming from North no Carolina. Tra- trades going on. Yeah. Well, the first overall pick right now if is it's the, the Carolina. It, oh, it's the Carolina Panthers, right? Well, the Carolina Panthers, but, which is now the Bears. Bears, yeah. So, what are the Bears going to do? Are they going to get rid of Justin Fields? That's a really good question there. I think it's 50-50. I would like from what I've seen about if they're moving on or not. That means that the Patriots have to move up two spots. Now, is that worth giving up like three first round picks or or is it or two or just one since it's just two spots or settle for someone else like you know drake may or uh, the other quarterbacks well too. who's the second team there um well the cardinals the um, cardinals it seems like the cardinals are going to be sticking with kyler murray which i don't blame them i mean kyler murray he, he came back and now he's he's winning i think they're going to get an offensive weapon and help out kyler murray and Get someone because you would trade down. So the, the, that's what I'm saying. That teams that well, the Patriots need to do is just be careful because it seems like in this draft, there's two teams. I mean, two quarterbacks are like top legit quarterbacks, which is Drake May and Caleb Williams. And since the Patriots are in the third overall pick, that means that they are in danger of losing that for the to, for that first or second team that's picking to trade to another team like the 49ers did to trade up for Trey Lance or something like that. Yeah, I could totally see that happening. There's still, I mean, there's still weeks in the season. It's it might far, change. Yeah. Far away. Yeah. We'll see what happens with that, but I think yeah, Mac Jones should start looking elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Um whether it is to get traded or released, but he needs to get out of there cuz it's not working out for either side. Let's move on to the extras. Some quick topics we have here. And go over now that obviously we're in the second half of the season, things are lining up to either be close for the wild card spots or maybe have a clear contender in the divisional spots. Super Bowl. All right. So that's going to be in Las Vegas. That's very exciting, too. And we got the playoff picture here. Obviously, your divisional leaders right on each side. Uh, number one seeds right now, Baltimore Ravens and the Eagles, as it currently sits, right? And I could name off a whole bunch more, but let's go over that. So, the Super Bowl is still up for grabs. Who do you, who would you say is the Super Bowl contenders here? I would still say it's the Chiefs and the Philadelphia Eagles. Even though we just saw them play against each other, it seems like that is like it could be a Super Bowl repeat. I do see Lamar Jackson with the Baltimore Ravens creeping up there, but I still don't see any team that's hugely dominating. I mean, we saw the Eagles play against the Bills yesterday, and they were horrible in the first half. And the Bills, if they if they threw that pass when they threw that pass to uh, to Davis, and if he had caught it, the game would have been over in overtime. Mm. And then when they played against the Cowboys, the Cowboys looked a little bit dominant, but of like always, they just hurt themselves and they lost the game. The Cowboys, but the Eagles didn't look dominant. The Chiefs, and uh, that's another team that they they struggle in the first half against the the Raiders, and they don't look as dominant. Like they need like better weaponry, or they need to build that more chemistry with Rice and Sky Sky Moore, and be able to. Let just make it more as a dominant team. So I still think it's up for grabs. Yeah, definitely. I don't see anyone taking over. For the NFC, it's Philly and 49ers. Um, and really, Philly, they are questionable, in my opinion. I think 49ers going to, going to do- dominate the NFC. And then we have AFC, again, also Kansas City. They can also have questionable games, right? But they still have Patrick Mahomes. They still have Andy Reid, which is the best duel you can ask for. So I can't rule them out just because of that. And kind of like Andy said, we have Baltimore that's going to probably sneak in. And we might have a 49ers-Baltimore rematch. That would be very interesting. That or the Chiefs-Eagles. Other than that, I think it's all kind of muddy, if I'm honest. With Jaguars, Lions, and then you got Miami, Falcons. Frauds, Miami. <laughs> you got the Steelers st- sneaking up there, even with their whole situation after Matt Canada, right? Yeah, it's not going to happen. Pretenders. Yeah. You know? Cowboys. Pretenders, sorry. I mean, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, as of right now, they are until they play a really good team and beat a really good team. They're doing what they're supposed to do, which is to destroy bad teams. Bad teams. Um, Browns and the Vikings. Without their starting quarterbacks, they're just not going to make it. And then Colts and Seahawks. 
nope. Those are pretty close uh, when it comes to the wild card spot, aside from the divisional leaders. But yeah, I would sit down and probably look at the obvious, right? The top two seeds on each side. They look pretty solid contenders, but there is some trouble with the Ravens, right? They're kind of known for being the team of just being the regular season champs. That's pretty much it. Um, I I really hope, I really hope I do see, because I like Lamar Jackson. I like that team as it is. They did suffer Mark Andrews, uh, losing him for the season. Um, and uh, Harba, right? Like, this guy has been fighting for who knows how long, right, to get back into the Super Bowl. I think it's a matter of time. I hope to see them. I like them as underdogs for Super Bowl contenders. But aside from that, I think the clear favorites, if I had to pick one from each side, would probably be the Eagles and Chiefs. But how about so? How about the Bills and the Eagles game? Um, I just want to point out that uh, Josh Allen is zero three ever since the overtime rules changed. It has now worked in his favor because it changed because of them. And oh boy, it has hurt them. It's not good for them. I, it's just an awful thing. That game was really interesting. Um, I unfortunately didn't watch the whole thing. I just watched the cut up highlights. I did see on Twitter and stuff like that that. Uh, apparently it was one-sided the refs were awful that game whatever you want to make of that but yeah the refs were not there was um a catch and fumble type thing against aj brown and i think they ruled it incomplete Mm -hmm. and then there was an earlier game that happened i can't recall at this moment in time but it was the same thing the uh, the later game the chargers and it's when when with allen caught the ball and then Turned around and, and then and fumbled. It was it. fumbled. Yeah, right. it was the exact same thing. In my eyes, it was the exact same thing. Someone, and you know what? I'm not even going to get into a conspiracy, but yeah, it was the same thing. <laughs> no, no. I, I also I also saw that the refs were like looking at big time holds and they weren't calling them against the Eagles. And you're like, what is going on? They tore up Josh Allen's jersey. Yeah, that horse collar tackle. The horse collar. And, but he's a big flopper too. So yeah. I don't know. You know uh, what I mean? Pretty close. Pretty close, but that was a game to watch as well. But what about the Sunday night game with the Baltimore Ravens and the Los Angeles Chargers? Uh, Los Angeles Chargers, that is a team we've also been talking about quite a bit, right? Obviously, new offensive coordinator, Kellen Moore. And obviously, you got uh, Justin Herbert under center, right? He's the franchise quarterback. You got your big weapons, right? They did lose. um, Oh, my gosh. I just lost his name. Mike Williams. Mike Williams, there you go. And then obviously they got Austin Eckler, all that kind of stuff. And the defense. The defense is insane. But we've talked about the head coach, Staley, right? He's It's been kind of an issue with the defense. And the offense seems to be struggling as well. Really close games. Really, really close games. Frustrating team to watch. The Chargers should not be struggling like they are right now. They're sitting 4-7. and seven. Is Herbert the problem for the Chargers? Absolutely, he's the problem for the Chargers. I mean, he's not helping his wide receivers like catch the ball and not fumble them. He needs to teach him not to fumble the ball. They need to run the correct routes. He needs to actually help the defense play better. And it's really, really disappointing that he cannot even improve his own defense. It's very frustrating. Okay, so I'm going to answer this seriously. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, he's not the problem, right? Um, but he's also not Patrick Mahomes. So that means he does need help around him but he also needs a better head coach he also needs a better offensive coordinator so this thing that's going on with Staley and Kellen Moore it's not working this is the last time we're going to see them in this year together it's time to move on from both of them I will actually just say it's mainly some coaching problem uh obviously the first finger I get to point is to Staley right other than that it gets kind of muddy for me I don't think Kellen Moore is necessarily the problem just yet um, I do see him trying to, it, it, it's because knowing how he was with the Cowboys, it's, he's a smart guy and I don't think he's a terrible coordinator at all. I don't think he's overrated. It's just frustrating. And I, I could see the offensive line being a problem. I do see that, uh, Kellen Moore did talk about, uh, the protection being, uh, an aspect when it comes down to close games and also the two minutes. Uh, you know, the two minute drill and stuff like that. Um, and obviously the defense, right? You you got to look at the defense. Uh, how do you have like that amount of talent and you can't be sitting at, at least at least top five, right? So that's an issue there. And I think they didn't need to move on from Staley. I don't think Herbert's the problem at all. No, 
<laughs> he is not the problem. It's just a very frustrating that you have a, such a talented quarterback and you're just like, his talent is just going to waste. Yeah. And, and, and you see that in many sports that the, any, like a, pers- a certain player is just not being used how he's supposed to. That's why when they move to another team, just like we saw Randy Moss when he went to the Raiders, he wasn't doing anything with the Raiders. Once he went to the Patriots, he was explosive. Um, and we saw the original Randy Moss that we saw with the Vikings. So it happens. We saw Megatron with Calvin Johnson and Detroit, just a big time wide receiver. I believe he would have been one of the greatest, but he was just not used at all well with Detroit. And it looks like it, it's happening the same thing with quarterback Herbert. So hopefully they find another uh, another coach that is capable of building this team. Because I've said it before, this is a, a Ferrari of a team. Yeah, it's it's a, definitely a frustrating thing, especially for Kellen Moore. Um, he's trying his best. I think he's trying his best, but you can only do so much. And I do, I do see the offensive line being an issue here, and they need to fix that and have some adjustments with the head coach and help out the defense, right, along with that. Let's move on to the final topics that we have for this episode. Fantasy updates for week 13. What is that for you? Fantasy pickups for week 13. We'll start off with Jaden Reed, the wide receiver for the Packers. He is rostered in 48% of the league, and he is actually leading all the Packers receiver in catches. And we saw him do really well this last Thanksgiving, so we'll, we hope that it just continues to roll. Next up, we have Pat Freymuth. I'm probably saying the, <laughs> the, the name incorrectly. He's the tight end for the Steelers. He's rostered in 48% of the league. And after firing an offensive coordinator Canada, the Steelers had their first game with above 400 yards offense. And the tight end caught nine yards for 120 yards. So we might see a more of a consistency there in the quarterback with the tight end. Lastly, we have Josh Downs, the wide receiver for the Colts. He is rostered in 47% of the league. He did have a knee injury, but during the, their bye week, he looks like he recovered because on Sunday he was on 70% of the offensive snaps, and he was actually targeted 13 times. So if you need a wide receiver, go pick him up. That's it. I think uh, I think you said something about Friar Muth, or however you say his name. Mm-hmm. You said he caught nine yards for 100 and something yards. Nine catches for 120 <laughs> yards. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so Pat... Uh, f- f- uh, f- Friar... Fry- Pat F. Pat F. Pettith, whatever you want to say. It's looking pretty good, so that might be a great pickup now that they have a new offensive coordinator. Holding on to the reins with that, and who knows what we'll see from the Steelers that are now sitting 74. What about the Week 13 picks? Week, let me look into those really quickly. Let me bring them up. Week 13 NFL picks. We'll start with Thursday night football. We have the Dallas Cowboys against the Seattle Seahawks. We saw the Seahawks just be destroyed by the 49ers. They couldn't really do anything offensively. We saw uh, just their offense just being really upset on the sidelines. And we see the Cowboys just destroying bad teams. And it could be another game in which the Cowboys just roll over the Seahawks. The Seahawks weren't doing that bad, but now it seems like they're just having so many problems. So I'm going to be taking the Cowboys. The Denver Broncos against the Houston Texans. Now we have Russ cooking with Sean Payne as the head coach. And then we have CJ Stroud, the new quarterback sensation for the Houston Texans. This is going to be the probably the game of the week for me. It's It might be a close game just because the offensive explosiveness of the Texans. But I do believe that the Broncos with Sean Payne and Russell Wilson are going to be able to defeat the rookie CJ Stroud. So I'm going to be taking the Broncos. The Pittsburgh Steelers against the Arizona Cardinals. The Steelers, they have a new face, a new identity. Now that offensive coordinator Canada is gone. But they are going to be facing Kyler Murray now that he's back and kicking with the Cardinals. And I'm just going to be taking the Cardinals. Kyler Murray is just so elusive, so quick. And it seems like he did bring a spark back to that team because now they're actually look like a winning type of team. So I'm going to be taking the Cardinals. 49ers against the Philadelphia Eagles. This is going to be another great game. Uh, We have the potential NFC Championship preview in this particular game. 
the Eagles, I've said it before, they look like they struggle, but they are, I do give them credit because even though they come up from behind, they, from behind, they do find a way to win. And the 49ers, they just look too dominant and offensive and defensively. So I'm going to be taking the 49ers. Sunday night football, we have the Kansas City Chiefs against the Green Bay Packers. I believe the Packers, even though they've been doing a little bit better, it's not going to be enough to beat the Kansas City Chiefs. The Kansas City Chiefs, they look like still the team to beat on the AFC side. So I am going to be taking the Chiefs. Monday night football, we have the Cincinnati Bengals against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Now that the quarterback, Macaulay Culkin, went down. He, unfortunately, is going to be home alone again in this particular Ooh. game. <laughs> so um, the Jaguars, they actually just barely pulled out a win against the Texans. And I believe they're going to be able to beat the Bengals without a quarterback. So I'm going to be taking the Jaguars. That would be it for the picks. This is also, uh, apart from week seven, the only two weeks, right? This is the second week where not four, but six teams are on a bye week. The Bills, Bears, Raiders, Vikings, Giants, and Ravens. So look for less games to watch. But that's that's pretty much it for that one. I'm pretty sure the well, bye weeks are pretty much almost done, if I'm not mistaken. I think there's like one or two left. Right? Yeah, I believe there's still like a couple more in December. I think it's just one more. You believe it's just one more? Remember, they extended to 18 weeks. Yeah, so. let me see. I don't think anyone goes on a bye on weeks. Obviously, not on the last week. No one right. goes on a bye. The last bye week, it seems to be the first week of, if it works, there you go. Yeah, the first week of December. So, okay. week 14. So is the last bye Yeah, week. Cardinals and Commanders. They're the last two to have buys. So, fantasy-wise, a lot of bye weeks. I, I think I just saw what's coming up for me not looking good. I've got a lot of players on the bye week. This is crucial to if you're trying to get into the playoffs. So, <laughs> oh man, that's a horrible time. Horrible time. But anyways, I think that's going to do it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening, guys. I appreciate it to those who made it to the very end. And we'd love to see you guys giving your opinion on our social medias, which is football underscore tailgaters on YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram. Thank you guys again for listening, and we'll see you guys next week.